Hello everybody, Mark Hayward here. So uh, before we go into the podcast uh, today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Daniel. So Daniel Tolston is the founder of Tolston Institute. We go really deep into his his limiting beliefs that have impacted his life in his teenage years, his 20s and early 30s. So we talk about that going into his, his physical and mental therapy that he was through uh, in a younger age. And then we go into what a varied career as a real estate agent, as a porn broker, then as a, a, a person on a plane serving people. Um, this guy has had such a huge amounts of of experience and understanding about people, about sales, about uh, developing relationships. This guy is such a good person to listen to. So really do listen to all the way to the end of the episode. Um, and then we go into what he does at the Daniel Institute, where he talks about emotional and, and intelligence and resilience. So if you're looking for inspiration, this guy's an purely inspirational person and you're looking to transform your life and your business then Daniel is the person to listen to so listen to the podcast all the way to the end and leave any comments or thoughts if you've got anything anything about his him and his business lastly if you're on uh, youtube please do hit the subscribe and the bell icon i'm releasing at least once a week with interviews and solo stuff so please do enjoy the episode and i will speak to you all soon this is the absolute business mindset podcast created and hosted by mark hayward this podcast will interview entrepreneurs business owners and people in their careers we will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones, and go deep into their area of expertise. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today, we have Daniel Tolston, who's the founder of Tolston Institute, which is a business coaching business. Hello, Daniel. How are you? Mark, I'm wonderful. And uh, I love that introduction. I think we can talk a lot about the failures today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we, it, it's important you learn from your failures and they can be great learning learning curves for, for us all. So um, there's, there's, there's no, from my side, there's no embarrassment or failures. I spend half my life failing at things just to get things right at the same time. Um, right, so we're going to start um, very early on where you were diagnosed with a learning disability at 11. Um, so that was very early. Was it, what, what type of learning disability was it? The learning disability that I was diagnosed with was linear sequential learning disability. Right. And how I experienced that was I would be sitting in the classroom and I'd be looking at the words on the board. I would look at them, I could see them, and then I'd write in my book. But nothing matched up. What was on the board and what matched up on my, uh, what was in my book right. was two totally different things. Even when I was reading a book, what I saw and what came out of my mouth was two totally different things. And so for me, I was having migraine headaches. I had a visual impairment, but I was also struggling because I was actually tone deaf and nobody realized. So I'm trying to have musical lessons and the only thing that I'm getting in, getting right are the mistakes. And so things weren't adding up. And then at age 11, I collapsed. One day at home, I was having bleeding noses. I couldn't breathe. My bronchial tubes had collapsed. And then my mum and dad really paid attention and started to get me a lot of medical help and support. And I was in and out of remedial therapy for five years wow. and it didn't stop. They poked me, they pricked me, I <laughs> blew into these pipes, I took all the asthma inhalers and it took a lot of time to get me back literally on my feet because my knees were collapsing, my hips were collapsing, my spine was twisted, the cranial plates were pushing down on the left and right hemisphere of the brain. And this is where a lot of the problems were coming from. Right. So in terms of education, uh, they sent me to a, a, a classroom called the Space Lab. Now, I thought it was for all the kids who were going to be astronauts, but it was for the kids who were just out of this world. <laughs> and that's where <laughs> I was at school with all the space cadets. <laughs> and and so you, I don't know what Epstein Barr virus uh, is, but was that related? Was that was that what you were having with the problems with your back and the Epstein Barr virus and chronic fatigue came a little bit later. Okay. So after I was in remedial therapy for five years, I got into high school. And then I got this Epstein-Barr virus and chronic fatigue. And I was in a lot of trouble because if you Google Epstein-Barr virus, 
on Google, uh, it tells you it's the kissing disease. So my mum wants to know who 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 have I been kissing? Which girls have been kissing? <laughs> but it, it's transferred by saliva. So you might share a drink with somebody and you might contract it. You might be at a restaurant using cutlery and they haven't washed it properly and you can contract it. Right. And for me, it then led on to chronic fatigue. So I was sleeping 14, 15, 16 hours a day. But just getting out of bed was a struggle because there's just energy. So I struggled with that and eventually uh, I dropped out of school. I finished year 10 and I couldn't get any further. And so that's how the chronic fatigue impacted me. And I've had bouts of it throughout my life where it comes back, it lays dormant in your system. Okay. And if you get really fatigued, it really knocks you about. So over the past 90 days, I've been on a 90 day reset, just resetting my body, getting a lot of sleep. My energy is great now. I was working till midnight last night, but sometimes it just shows up and it attacks. So, so, so school was a struggle for you all the way through. There was, there was, there was issues, there was conditions that you had. Um, did that affect, and I, I mean this not, not in the way it might come over, but did that have trouble with your education your actual learning like what, what could you read and write and by by the time you were 17 or or was or were you still struggling at that age i think what the biggest negative impact was it was the limiting beliefs that came along with it so even up until age 32 uh, i'm 41 now at age 32 i was still struggling with and i'd tell myself i'm not smart enough I'm not educated enough. I don't know enough. I don't have a degree. Mm. So the biggest disability that I was left with was the mental and emotional blocks from it. Mm. I could learn to read. I could learn to write. It's, it's impossible not to learn. But formally, it was a challenge for me. So my spelling, my grammar is very good today, but it's taken a lot of time. I can read today, I can speed read, I can read a book in uh, about 90 minutes and have great comprehension, yeah. but I have had to relearn how to actually learn. Okay, interesting, interesting. But the, the, the biggest challenge, um, and hopefully we come back to this later on, I did try to go to university when I was 28 and I lasted a semester and they said, we think you should leave. <laughs> Yeah, we'll come to that. We'll come to that because there is a there's a there's a sequence of events which takes you through that. So we will cover that um, as well. Um, but your first job. Now, you did say you were a paper boy, but I'm not going to include being a paper boy, although not, not not valuable to the community. But your first proper job was a real estate agent in Australia. Is that right? It was my uncle was uh, he was my first employer he employed me as a paper boy <laughs> and then he employed me again as a real estate agent and at about age 19 he called me up and he said you're reckless you're out of control uh, you need to pull your head into line and you need to do something with your life and i said well what does that involve he said it involves a job in real estate he said come and learn how to prospect i'll teach you how to sell and I'll show you how to make a lot of money with no education. And I remember my Uncle John said to me very clearly in 2019, he said, in real estate, in the field of selling, it doesn't matter if you're educated or not. Right. He said, you've got a great attitude. You've got a winning attitude. You're personable. He says, you're going to get paid for those skills. Right. So what I found was when I got into real estate, he was able to teach me what other successful people were doing. And the formula was simple. He helped me overcome mental and emotional blockages around fears of rejection and fears of criticism. And he showed me how to ask for an order. And within 12 months, I was in the top 10 sales creators in the country. Wow. And then before I was uh, 20, I'd purchased my first investment property. And so I was probably making more money than my school teachers right. in my rookie year of real estate. And, and do you still own property? Do you still own real estate now? No, I didn't. I, I cashed in many years ago and I used the money to invest in my new business. Okay, right. Good. Um, and then um, I'm not sure how serious this, this 
role was, but you, you're a secondhand dealer and pawnbroker for 15 years. So was this was this like a side hustle that you did as well as the real estate or was that uh, another role in your sort of evolution? Well, I like to say my mum was in porn and I like to say my dad was in porn. <laughs> and, and we owned a pawnbroking business and it was launched in about 1992. And I think it continued through till about 2009. I think it was about 2009. And previous to that, my uncle owned a pawnbroking business and called the Bathurst Curiosity Shop. So my parents launched this business and it was a phenomenal business. What you would do is you'd buy secondhand goods for about a quarter of the price and then you could resell them for about two thirds of the current retail price. You could also lend your own money out at a 20% per month return. Wow. Now you might be doing small loans, but when you're lending out $100 and you're getting $20 back per month, on your own money. It's a license to print money. So we learned to buy secondhand goods and then to trade them. And then quickly what I learned once things like eBay came around, I learned about e-commerce. So I started to buy secondhand goods at a very low price and then I opened up the marketplace. So instead of selling locally, I started to sell across borders, nationally across Australia. Mm. And I remember somebody bought into the business one day a big black plastic rubbish bag full of old games, like old Atari games. Right. And I looked at them and I knew they were worth a fortune. And I said to the person, how much do you want for them? They said, oh, whatever, a couple of bucks each. So I might have paid about $80, but I quickly turned it into thousands and thousands of dollars. I used to buy PlayStation 2s. Mm. And a PlayStation 2... You could buy for about $80, but depending on the time of year, I could mark it up to $150 or even $220. And I used to stockpile them by the hundreds. So I learned to uh, sell and trade. And then through that time, we had another side hustle within that business. So we've got our family business. I'm doing real estate. And then not long after that, my brother and I started to produce films for our, our own business. And we launched a clothing company and an e-commerce business. So there was many things happening at all family businesses intertwined. And I would have been in the family business through till about 2007. And what was it like family businesses um, with working with your mum and dad uh, and the pawnbrokers, would you say? Well, my dad's, uh, he was born on a farm and he's really quiet. And he would hide out the back of the business. <laughs> so he would hide. He would hide out the back. Uh, my brother and I would be out the front, and my mum was really cool. So she gave us free reign of how we wanted to run the business and how to grow the business. So we bought in a lot of new products and services. We were given the opportunity to work with the business coach, consultants, and mentors. Uh, I wanted it. My mum wanted it, but the conflict was my brother didn't want it. So we could have grown our business. We could have expanded it, but it ended up saying, staying significantly small because we couldn't get the buy-in from everybody to grow the business. And then, then you started traveling, started moving around. You, you, you went to Dubai. So tell me about your experience in Dubai in 2007. Well, Dubai, I flew in on, uh, in, I think, uh, about... May 2007, and I landed in Dubai. And as soon as I got into Dubai, my first feeling was, this is my belonging place. Something just clicked inside of me, and I said, I feel at home here. And in 2007, they were building the Burj Khalifa, which is the um, one of the world's source buildings. Mm -hmm. So they're building it, and the construction is taking place. There's a hustle, there's a bustle, there's 140 different nationalities. And everybody has left their home, 89% of people who live in the Middle East, in the UAE, are expatriates. And they're all coming for a better life. So there's this energy, there's this vibrance, there's this buzz. And I came over to help a gentleman launch a business on the border of Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And he was launching a water sports business. And what they needed was they needed somebody to do media and to do coaching. So in 2006, I was an Australian champion athlete, all over the press, all over the videos, all over the magazines. So they brought me in 
TV, radio, press, and I started to coach the expatriates and the locals. And it was going good. It was really good. And then um, whilst I was there, my business partner and I, something must have happened. I'm still trying to figure it out. But he betrayed me and I lost my business. So I'm in the Middle East. I've lost my business. I've got to finish a work contract. And unfortunately, uh, that left me with no job to come home to Australia with. So I finished off my contract, came home, uh, couldn't resolve the problem, walked away from my family business and came back to Dubai. And I started to work for a multinational. The job that I had taken was a sales role, but it was definitely not what I was promised. So after another 90 days, I came back to Australia uh, with my tail between my leg. <laughs> and I was broke. And things really went downhill. So 2008 was a real turning point for me. I started to become a builder's labourer. This was when the no education caught up with me. Nobody could recognise my soft skills at that stage. Nobody would take notice of my attitude. Wow. And so I had to make ends meet. And I was a builder's labourer. Uh, I was shoveling concrete, crawling around roofs. And then when I really needed money, I'd become a lollipop man. And a lollipop man is probably the worst job on the construction site. People throw all types of interesting things at you. And there I was, two th middle of 2008. And I asked myself, is this what I'm here to do? Is this my life? Is this all I've got on me to control traffic, stop and slow? Mm. And that's when all those fears and doubts came up. And I thought to myself, maybe I am really screwed because of those learning disabilities. I don't have a certificate. Everybody wants certificates. Everybody's gone to university. I don't have that. And... I, I made a commitment one day. I said, screw this. This is not what I'm born to do. I'm born for greatness. I'm born to do better things. And I'm going back to Dubai. And literally that afternoon, I was driving across the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Mm. I looked up and I saw this white building and this sign on top of the building. And it said Emirates. And I said, I'm going to go and buy the newspaper. I went and bought the newspaper and they were advertising for jobs. And it was within two weeks. So I rang them up, submitted my CV went down there, blew them away into the interview, and six weeks later, I was back living in Dubai. And I knew that was the time where I could really reinvent myself. So I still had my fears, I had my mental and emotional baggage, but I was far away enough from my family and friends to be able to reinvent myself. So that was a big turning point. And uh, so were you part of the cabin crew? Was that, was that your role? My role was cabin crew. There, so, there must be loads of stories, probably X-rated, but is, is there lots of stories you could tell me about being part of the cabin crew at Emirates? Well, um, the first thing is they say, don't screw the crew. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you just let your mind wander on that one, and uh, I had an ex-girlfriend and she was cabin crew for Emirates. And that's kind of what got me into the role. And she said, don't screw the crew. And uh, she said many things. That one I definitely agreed with. And one thing about cabin crew, for the majority of people, what they want is they want the millionaire's lifestyle. And they're willing to accept the lemonade wage. So what happens is they fly around the world in business and first class. We stay in five-star hotels. You walk into the London Marriott and you literally put your hand out and they put 80 quid in your hand and you got pocket money. So everywhere you go in the world, somebody gives you a handful of cash when you get there and you go out and you dine at fancy restaurants, you sleep in five-star hotels. And my team, when I, when I joined, there was probably about uh, 8,000 people there. And it was the year that they introduced the A380 into Emirates Airline. So there was a big buzz. And I started in the economy class cabin. Uh, I've been attacked. I've been beaten up on the aircraft. I've been spat on. I've been kicked in the balls by customers. Oh I've had people uh, getting close to dying. I've had medical emergencies. Um, I've been on an aircraft that dropped a couple of hundred foot and um, all of us ended up on the ceiling. Uh, phenomenal experience. Uh, I, I encourage any member of of today's youth to explore the world. Once COVID disappears, uh, go and become cabin crew. Learn about yourself. Understand the world. It's a beautiful job. Fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, so you were there four years. Um, 
And after four years, you then went into business coaching. What, what, how, how does, where does the, the sort of continuation of your story go into uh, business coaching? It's kind of like the hero's journey, Mark. Uh, the you meet a mentor, <laughs> and I was, I was, I was flying to the UK. I was flying to Manchester, and I was in economy cabin, and um, all types of people would hit on me. <laughs> men, women, married men, married females. Uh, I was good looking. I was big and handsome, and I was walking through the cabin with my trolley. Very manly thing to do. And a guy stopped me, and he said, "Oh, I love your aura." <laughs> I said to him, I said, are you hitting on me? And he said, no. I, he said, I love your aura. I said, well, what's an aura? He said, it's your energetic field. He says, you're glowing. And I said, well, thank you. I said, sounds like you need another drink. And he said, no, I don't drink. <laughs> I said, you must be if you're seeing stuff up here. Anyway, he said, no, 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 I'm a life coach. And I went, a life watch? What? And he said, I'm a life coach. And his name was Christoph, Christoph Spiceness. And I ended up having a great chat to him in the galley. He told me what he did as a life coach. Um, we had a great conversation and I ended up hiring him. So I would fly from Dubai to Manchester on a on a flight, lay over, have a coaching session. And then when he was in Dubai, I'd meet him for coaching sessions. And so that's when I got into coaching. So 2008, I started to study behavioral psychology. I started to study NLP, coaching, hypnotherapy, anything I could find on personal development. I joined peer support and I was trained by Emirates Airlines in peer support and critical incident stress management. So I started to get all of these clients, all of these people who had these traumatic experiences, death on board on the aircraft. So I'd started to learn. As you do, uh, you meet the crew and you don't screw the crew at all. You never do that. And uh, I actually met a beautiful Taiwanese cabin crew on the way to Johannesburg. And today she's my wife. So we met, that was in 2009. And then at the start of 2010, uh, as I mentioned before, I was in peer support. I got a call four o'clock in the morning. You never get good news at 4 a.m. in the morning. And the phone rang and I picked it up. And the duty controller said, Daniel, there's been a accident on board the London Gatwick flight into Dubai. This is not a peer support call. And I thought, what does that mean? They said, it's your fiance. She's been in an accident. So I quickly went down to Landside Hospital. And there she was in a cast from her ankle to her hip. She had an accident on the aircraft and fractured her knee in five places. So for the following two and a half years, she was flown around the world in and out of surgery and rehabilitation. Coming up to 2011, I just got my leadership role. I'd been trained up in leadership. I'm now co-leading a team of 17,000 people. We get to 2012 and then she loses her job. And then after the loss of the job, you've got to leave the country. And the stress was so great that she almost miscarried three times. So I'm going through this trying to support her, but she's just had two and a half years of surgery. She's struggling with depression and anxiety. She even got to a stage where she wanted to end her life because it was so traumatic for her, all of these operations. Mm. So it was very tender. And she was due to give birth in December 2012. And I asked my company, I said, look, my wife's just lost her job. Uh, can you help me with some time off to be there for the birth of my daughter? And they said, Daniel, we've given you as much time off as we could over the past two and a half years, but you've got no holidays. So you've got to make a choice. Do you want to stay and take the risk of not getting days off? Or do you want to resign and be there for the birth of your daughter? Now, I've almost lost my daughter three times during pregnancy. And it's a tough decision to walk away from co-leading a team of 17,000 and having your career path mapped out. Yeah. So I, I pulled the pin and I said, well, uh, love is more important than career at this stage and family is more important than the friends I've made. And so I resigned from my job and I was there for the birth of my daughter in 2012. And so what we had to do then, we had to launch our business. We launched our business. Uh, I had sold my real estate, so I pumped all of my money into building my business. Mm. But I'm green. I'm wet behind the ears. I don't know what's happening in this industry because it was always a side hustle. Mm. By June 2013, I'm breathing like this. 
<gasps> I said to my wife, I said, I think I've got a, a lung infection. So uh, I went down to the doctors and they said, uh, Mr. Tolson, there's nothing wrong with your lungs. It's all in your mind. We might send you over to a psychologist. And so what had happened for me, um, I ended up being depressed and I was grieving the loss of my lifestyle in Dubai. I was grieving the loss of my career. And because all of my attention was on what I used to have and actually not what I was doing, I'd been sabotaging my own success. Mm. And I was pumping money into the business. I was not getting a return on it. And the money was running out. So I started to work for jobs. I applied for more than 600 jobs. And I didn't get responses. I didn't get an interview because they all wanted the same thing. Certificates, degrees, etc. And I thought once again, there we go. There's the learning disabilities coming back to haunt me. Mm. And so by the end of 2012, the sole reason my wife and I moved back to Australia was to go back on social security. It was the only money that I could legitimately get without having to beg family for money. And I didn't want to beg. So we went on social security and I made a decision that I was going to make this business work. And in the first hundred days of business in Australia, I made my first hundred thousand dollars. So it was a great payoff. Yeah. And that was 2014. And now you've served over 15,000 companies and individuals as a consultant. What have you learned from the huge number of people that you've helped? What I've learned is that the most important skill for both career-minded people and business owners is resiliency. And what I had learned through all of my learning disabilities, through the Epstein-Barr virus, through the back-to-back -back knee operations, from almost being killed, I got beaten up by six guys who basically tried to kill me, was that I had learned resiliency. And resiliency was the ability just to pick myself back up after I got knocked down. And in the world of success in business, everybody agrees that goal setting is important. Mm. Nobody disagrees that it's unimportant. However, 99% of people give up before their very first attempt on their goals. Wow. They quit before they even start. And so what I'm finding with the type of business coaching that I do, specializing in emotional intelligence, people want to be learn to become resilient. They can't get it off YouTube. They can't get it out of a pill. They've got to learn how to become resilient. So I'm finding that resiliency is the key. And all the successful people that I'm working with at the moment, these people are not smarter than anybody else. Their IQ is not higher than anybody else. Most of them are uneducated formally, yet they have this ability to try many different things. They will try the same strategy a dozen times, even if it doesn't work, because they refuse to give in. They hire coaches, they hire mentors, they go to trainings, they get out of their comfort zones, and they just keep going. And quitting is never an option. And this is what I'm learning. What, what type of clients do you actually work with? So you say you work with companies and individuals. So what, put it differently, what, what's your ideal client? Who, who are the people you're targeting? My client is less of a demographic, less of a geographic, and it's more of a psychographic. So normally my clients come to me and they don't use these words, but they have this feeling of an unfulfilled potential. They feel like they have an income glass ceiling. They feel like they're an imposter. They're starting to doubt and second guess themselves that they're going in the right direction. These people tend to be about 35 to 55 years of age, about 70% are female and about 30% are male. So I get a lot of women coming to work with me specifically. And the 30% of men that come to me are very emotionally aware. They're not this rough, tough, rugged boys boy. They're emotionally aware. And the companies that they come from, there's been people coming from PricewaterhouseCoopers. They're valued at $43 billion. Yeah, I have, okay, I've got lawyers who are working with me. They've been in their careers for 20 years. I have doctors. I have university lecturers. I have farmers. And, you know, we're talking businesses, farming businesses with more than $100 million in revenues per year. We have people building play equipment for childcare centers. We have accountants, 
ex-nurses. It's a whole mixed bag. So, so say real what, I'm interested, what I'm interested about this is, so you started building this in 2012, we're now in 2021. How did you get from helping a few people to getting into large organizations, getting into farm, like large high net worth people? How did you make that progression through your coaching business career? Leverage. The most important form of leverage that I have learned over the years is to leverage other people's contacts. I remember a influencer in the United Kingdom reached out to me. I got onto a Facebook Live. We were doing Facebook Lives with more than 400 people on there back in 2016. And from one influencer, he was, you know, he enabled, he introduced me to literally thousands of people in his network. And so it was through other people referring me to their audiences. So what I do with my business today is I'm looking for people who are working with the same types of people that I want to work with. I have a great business partner in Malaysia and people come to him to learn to become entrepreneurs. And one of his events last year, we were getting 1,300 people at a time on our live events. And so they're coming to learn to become an entrepreneur. Mm. Other people are teaching marketing. Other people are teaching selling. And the missing link there for them is the resiliency. So people get all this knowledge. They get all of this skill, but they're missing the mindset. Mm. So over the years, people have said, Daniel, come and speak to our audiences. So people will put me on stage in front of 500 600, 700 people. Mm. And my growth has come from leveraging other people's audience rather than having to do it myself. Right, right. Um, moving on. So tell me about your 12-month program. Is it 100 times DNA Accelerator? 100 X DNA Accelerator. Right. So our DNA, what I'm made of, what you're made of, if we took this and we stretched it out in a line, it would reach to the sun and back more than 100 times. And this really demonstrates that we have so much potential. I have seen real estate agents double their income inside of 90 days by making a few small improvements to their mindset. So in the 100X DNA Accelerator, it's a group coaching program. And throughout the year, we learn to have relationship breakthroughs. Our major success in life comes through other people. It's that social intelligence. It's the ability to get along with other people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these things that they're learning, they're not inborn attributes. They're required attributes. They're skills that people have to learn along the way. So we teach them about other people. We teach them about other people's personality types, mm -hmm. what motivates other people. So we have a relationship recharge which is fascinating. People start to communicate with their children. I don't know if you know this, but most parents spend more time brushing their teeth than communicating to their children. We spend three minutes a day brushing our teeth and most parents spend two minutes a day speaking to their children. So we help them get those family relationships sorted. At this time of year, we focus heavily on goal setting. Everybody knows goal setting is important, but people don't know how to do it. And people have been set up for failure. I remember one of the business partners in the real estate agent that I worked with, they were always pushing me so far out of my comfort zone with my goals and targets that only failure was possible. So what I learned at an early age was that goal setting was hit and miss. Sometimes I got it, sometimes I didn't. Sometimes the goal was so big that I'd just end up self-sabotaging. Mm. So we teach them how to set goals, goals that are right for them. And not just what goals look good on paper. What's good for your personality? If you're a type of person who is more optimistic, you love to influence people and contacts, what are you doing being an accountant, sitting behind a computer, doing spreadsheets all day? Leverage your unique talents and get out there in front of people. And sometimes, because people don't understand this about themselves, they don't know the right goals to set for themselves. Right. In addition, we perform scientific case studies on them and we're looking at their motivators. And I go deep into them with 12 different types of motivators. Mm. 
So we have some people who are phenomenal and they succeed in companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers because what they're driven for, driven by is a structured environment. The structured environment gives them safety and security. But that motivator doesn't tend to work when they start their entrepreneurial venture. Once they become an entrepreneur, they've got to go into an environment that's more receptive. And because they've got to break the rules and they don't like to do it, they end up procrastinating and sabotaging their own success. So we take them through that. Throughout the program, we also get them to use a new form of artificial intelligence. And by doing a 90 second voice recording, we can capture more than 1,440 emotional imprints that exist in the amygdala. And we can have a look at people's emotional life journey. And we can start to predict their personality styles and what's also going to cause them stress. We teach them about we teach them about their qualities and characteristics so they can make better decisions. If they make better decisions, they take the right actions and then they end up getting the results. So an example of a result, we've got one woman who's in the program. Low self-confidence, low self-esteem. However, as she's improved that self-esteem and confidence throughout COVID, she has increased her sales by 138 million ringgit. So that would be like um, 40 million US dollars. Wow. Massive. But it's getting that confidence. You know, it's getting that resiliency. All of these skills that are so important, all the soft skills. In addition, we teach them how to sell, but not teach them how to sell products and services, how to sell to the personality types, to look at somebody and figure out what is important to this person. Is this person looking for a result? How do you sell that to that? How do you sell to that person? Is this person looking for recognition? How do you sell to that? Is this person wanting a relationship? How do you sell to that? Is this person looking for something to avoid risk? How do you sell to that? So we teach them how to sell to the psychological types. And these are all the things we learn over a one year period in a hundred X DNA. Amazing. Amazing. Sounds a brilliant brilliant course um i would definitely from what you've talked about there would definitely promote that that would sound fantastic um what so what do you see in the next two to five years for you and your business what i see is i'm gonna see, i see more crises is coming we're seeing a, a big shift in employment at the moment. We're seeing a lot of people um, escape their corporate careers and they're wanting to start their own business. They want to live life on their terms. And I'm going, I'm predicting that we're going to see a lot of people leave corporate and they're going to start their own businesses. And in the next year or two, just like me, they're wet behind the ears, they're still green and they're going to lose a ton of money and they'll want support. The support that I see people are, will be needing will be overcoming grief. The moment that COVID hit, we went into a grief cycle. And the first stage of the grief cycle is denial. After denial, then people start to get angry. They're fighting, what do you call it in the UK? Bog roll. They're fighting over bog <laughs> roll. <laughs> yes. And then after that, the grief cycle goes. And so they have to learn new coping mechanisms. They have to learn how to cope. So I had 2,222 people through my 100X DNA masterclass this past year, and I believe I'll see another 5,000 people over the next one to two years. And my biggest calling will also be with what's called job matching. People today want to work in a role that goes beyond just the money. They want to have a career that aligns with their intrinsic motivators. They want to feel that they're making a significant impact in their life. And in addition, they also want the company to make a contribution to their life. So with job matching, what we can do for our clients is we can reduce the risk of a mishire or a bad hire by up to 93% using science. And some of my clients are saving themselves a million dollars per bad hire. And some companies I've helped save 10 or 20 bad hires in the last couple of years. Mm. And this is going to be a field that's going to emerge. Uh, there's going to be fewer job opportunities and more people applying for them. And a small business can't afford to make a hiring mistake. A hiring mistake will cost you three to five times that person's annual salary. So if you're going to pay them 50,000 pounds and you screw it up, 
that hiring mistake might cost you 150000 So that's what I see coming up for me over the next couple of years. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of the interview. I asked the same six questions to all of my guests. They're quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. Um, first one is, what's the best decision that you made? <laughs> to get married to my wife. I think that was the best decision I've ever made. I've got somebody who unconditionally supports me and through failure, and I've failed many times, Mark. I've failed more times than anybody else. I've wanted to quit. And she said, don't you dare quit. She said, if you're quitting on yourself, you're quitting on me. <laughs> so definitely getting married has been the best decision. Thank you. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? Enthusiasm outsells experience 10 to 1. And my uncle told me that. My uncle John said, when I got into real estate, he said, enthusiasm outsells experience 10 to 1. Show people your willingness to work. Get excited about their property. Show them that you're going to work hard, that you're going to uh, work longer hours than anybody else and get really passionate about their home. And I've always carried that through. Uh, today in my book called Win Sales Now, I call it flying the flag. I love to fly the flag of my customers. And if I take a customer on, I've got to believe in their product and service. So remember, enthusiasm outsells experience 10 to 1 in any market. Amazing. Thank you. Um, who's helped you most in your career? Well, I would say Brian Tracy. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's an American author. Yeah. Yeah. The first book that I got, uh, first personal development book, was a book called Maximum Achievement. My uncle John gave it to me. He wrote on the inside cover to Danny Boy, this is your blueprint of success. I applied that. Uh, I ended up becoming a three-time state champion athlete, an Australian champion athlete, and then I ended up having a business with Brian Tracy. He became my business partner and my mentor. I also had the pleasure to be asked uh, from all the people around the world that he knows to come and speak on his behalf. So when I was in San Diego, I addressed 250 business people on his behalf because he was sick and ill and he couldn't speak. And he's helped me personally, professionally, and also as a friend. Oh, I love Brian Tracy. Eat That Frog was one of my one of my favourite books. It was one of the first, when I started my sort of self-development um I don't know what you call it, like, pro, like approach to life. And that was one of the first ones because I was suffering from procrastination quite a lot. And it was just being able to, he really gave me a great insight into prioritizing and getting, getting shit done, basically, which is so, so important and so, so important for entrepreneurship. There's so much procrastination with entrepreneurs that, uh, getting stuff done is is really important so uh, that was right. that was the first training i delivered to my clients in the uk it was right. like that frog yeah. i flew into manchester delivered it in manchester then i went all the way down south to farnborough and yeah. i delivered yeah. it in farnborough came back the next year and i delivered it in birmingham right there is it in the midlands yeah yeah, yeah i yeah. was teaching eat that frog oh, all over man. there i was teaching it in australia i, I love that program beautiful it's brilliant um do you have any regrets the biggest regret, uh, my fears, my doubts, and my own limiting beliefs. And my greatest regret was I didn't ask for help. I knew when I was learning sports, my brother used to say to me, he'd say, Danny, he'd say, you're better than all of us. He said, but your biggest problem is you get caught up in your head. And so what I wanted to portray that I was tough, and they used to call me Danny Danger. That was my name. They called me Daniel Danger, and I was wild and reckless. That's why my uncle gave me a job. And I had to put on the face that I wasn't scared, but inside I was always afraid of getting hurt. I was so afraid that I was going to injure my knees because I'd had so much problems. And something really interesting my brother said to me one day, he said, as soon as the camera's on, as soon as the crowd's on, you'll perform and you'll put on a show. You'll beat everybody. But when you train, you're too afraid to fall. You're afraid to fail. You're afraid to make a mistake. And I knew there was nothing wrong with me physically, but it was mentally. I didn't know how to control those thoughts. And my biggest regret was because of my ego, because of that persona of Daniel Danger, I refused to ask for help. And I could have been so much further ahead if I would have just asked other people, please give me some help. What sport did you did you 
playing? Wakeboarding. Wakeboarding. Okay. Yeah. okay. Do you know you know Thorpe Park? Not too yeah. far from where you are. Thorpe yeah. Park. I, I worked in Thorpe Park wow. in two thousand and one. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. I lived in Ascot, not too far from you. I know, that's amazing. Um, just on that, um, some uh, a thought I, I've had is, because you, you talk a lot about emotional intelligence and, and resilience, and do you think that your uh, emotionally aware or emotionally intelligent is due to those failures, those hard times, those knocks, that you've had throughout your life and career and that has made you better at, at, at your controlling and mastering your own emotions well i'd have to admit that my ex-girlfriends would probably say i was emotionally disabled <laughs> <laughs> my mum would say my father's emotionally disabled so it was nothing that i was taught growing up um my grandfather he was a boxer so you had to be a man you had to be tough it's skills that I've had to learn along the way. And I invest heavily in myself into a coach. I have a voice coach. I've been working with a voice coach since uh, 2017. I worked with Brian Tracy, learning how to become a professional speaker. I have a spiritual coach. I have a personal trainer. I even have my own business coach. And I am, my level of awareness is still here. It's still so low. There's so much to learn but I'm putting myself in environments where people who are more successful than me are giving me really good feedback. Mm -hmm. Most feedback is just like blowing smoke up somebody's bum, being a brown nose. You can't learn anything from that. And I've put myself in environments where I've asked people to give me a real dressing down. Tell me honestly. You know, I remember Brian Tracy. He charges two and a half thousand US dollars per hour. I hired him as my personal coach at two and a half thousand US dollars an hour because I said, I want to be like Brian. And I said to Brian one day, I said, Brian, I'm not getting the results that I want. I said, I've tried everything that I know. Maybe I'm the problem. And he just looked at me and he laughed and he smiled and he said, if anybody can admit that they might be the problem, they're definitely not the problem. And I've even invested into that level. And I work with all the people that I've trained with, uh, meaning that my mentors, I've hired them personally because I want to be my best. So it's been a process. Uh, it's always evolving. I'm far from being perfect. I've got to learn to deal with my anger. You know, one of the things that made me a successful athlete and made me Daniel Danger was I'm aggressive. I want to win. I'm competitive. But if I don't get my own way, I've got to learn to manage that anger. And I might have managed that when I started my business at this level. But when you go from five to six to seven figures, you've got to learn all of this all over again. Yeah. So it's a moving target yeah. with professional speaking. I can uh, face rejection in a one-to-one -one conversation. That's easy. I can do it one to five, one to 10, but I had to learn to do it one to 500. I had to learn to deal with rejection speaking to a thousand people. I was even asked to speak to an audience of 5,000 people in Vietnam. And Brian Tracy asked me to speak on his behalf because once again, he was sick and he couldn't fly. And he said, could you speak to this audience of 5,000 people? And I said, I'm not ready. His business partner said, if you can speak to a thousand, you can speak to 5,000. I said, I'm not ready. And so at least emotionally, I knew I wasn't ready to get and deal with 5,000 rejection from 5,000. And I'm glad I didn't do the speech because the guy who ended up doing it, he got crucified by the audience. <laughs> so it could have saved my career. Just that little <laughs> bit of emotional awareness. All right, back to, back to the quick five questions. What are you most proud of? I'm proud of my resiliency. I'm proud that although I've said I'd give up, I'd never give up. And so I'm relentless in the pursuit of my dreams. That's what I'm most proud of. Brilliant. And what does legacy mean to you? Legacy lives on through my customers. I say my customers and my business cards. When my customers succeed, I get to experience all of that joy. When my customers crash and burn, I feel all of that. But as their coach, I'm there to pick them back up. And all of my clients have become my lifelong friends. So I'm incredibly proud of that. And that's my legacy. Fantastic. And lastly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Come and play. Just write to me directly. Send me an email, daniel at danieltolson.com. Write to me. Uh, don't be like I was in the past and never ask for help. Reach out.
you can reach out personally or you can also come and play on Facebook. I've got a group of about 763 business people and the group's called Accelerate and Multiply. And I'm putting videos in there on a weekly basis, all educational content for you to become more successful in your career and your business. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Dan. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. My pleasure. Thank you, Mark. 